Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, the host that is officially out of school for the summer and finally have time to get caught up on all of the things I haven't had time to do. I'm Katie, and it doesn't matter the season, I'm never caught up. (laughs) I wish you were joking. (laughs) I wish I was joking, but I'm not. So let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 18, The Weighing of the Wands, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. The rest of the school hates Harry, but that doesn't make him desperate enough to hang out with the Creedy brothers. Ron could learn something about friendship from Hermione. When given a choice between walking the scroots and detention with Snape, no one is quite sure which grenade they'd jump on. Potter may stink, but at least he's not an asshole. Despite being a little extra when it comes to Harry, Colin Creedy is pretty badass when he contradicts Snape. And more press is exactly what Harry needs. Except for the part where he totally doesn't. During episode 83, Expelliarmus and Prey, our Potter pondering was, would you rather walk a scroot or deal with Snape for potions slash detentions? Diana said, give me the leash. Like her fellow Hufflepuff Newt, she would gladly walk the scroot. That rhymes. Yeah, it does. Carly said, scroot for sure. Maybe we could snuggle, too. Seems to be the Hufflepuff response. Yeah, because Dave is also a Hufflepuff, and he said he would get one of those muggle stiff leashes you use to walk your invisible dogs and make it so the scroot walks behind him the whole time, and he's happy as a haggard in a room full of three-headed puppies. <laughs> Mike feels like despite the actual danger posed by the Scroots, he thinks he would feel in more physical danger with Snape. Maybe he's just being a dick with a threat to poison people, but he thinks he'd take his chances with the Scroot. Especially since they aren't fully grown yet. And the Scroots don't single people out. And according to Hagrid, they enjoy walks. So, they're basically just armor-plated murder dogs. <laughs> Juliana says it's a tough call for her, but she's going to go with the scroot. Knowing Snape's tendency to bully students, he would probably make her cry frequently, because she's a sensitive claw. Aww. Robert said seeing how he is a perfectly cunning Slytherin, detention with his head of house seems like a reasonable excuse to plan murder-munching situations to please old Moldy Voldy. Amanda said she'd rather walk the scroots. Hagrid is awesome, even if a bit misguided in his trust of creatures. Madame Pomfrey can heal physical wounds almost instantly. The mental wounds Snape likes to inflict would take much longer to heal. She's too sensitive of a little Hufflepuff to willingly deal with Snape's bullshit. Quincy said Snape is a dick for sure, but I feel like I'd be more safe with Snape even if he gets on my never-ending everlasting gobstopper nerves. I'd pick him because I believe he has his limits and knows them. Scroots are some weird breed that Hagrid found and tried to domesticate. Like, what the fuck are they? Pokemon? A scorpion and a blastoid fucked sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. And all of y'all picking the Scroots, Diana, Juliana, Carly, Mike, I'm looking at you. More power to y'all. But that's a fuck nope on a rope from me. And I already am not an animal person to begin with. And y'all know how I feel about Snape. So if I'm picking him over Satan's hellhounds, you know something is wrong with those things. No, no, and fuck nope. And fuck Newell with something hard and sandpapery for leaving all the best scenes out of this movie. And I hope he gets a yeast infection. That's harsh. That is. (laughs) Once again, Quincy does not hold back. Not at all. Damn, I love reading those rants, though. Our trivia question last week was, how did Rita Skeeter describe Dumbledore in her piece about the International Confederation of Wizards Conference? 
When Dumbledore caught Rita Skeeter being creepy in the cupboard with Harry, she asked him if he saw her piece about the International Confederation of Wizards Conference, and Dumbledore called it enchantingly nasty, saying he particularly enjoyed the part where she described him as an obsolete dingbat. Congratulations goes to Mike Riley. He's halfway to the record at four weeks in a row. I mean, there wasn't a lot of competition for this one, so let's see if he can keep it going for this week's question. For now, let's just keep rolling into the second half of Chapter 18, The Weighing of the Wands, and the film section that actually does somewhat correspond. Chapter 18, The Weighing of the Wands, Part 2. Harry finds himself in a fairly small classroom, with the desks pushed aside to leave a large space in the middle, and three lined up and covered with velvet in front of the blackboard. Five chairs are behind it, one filled by Ludo Bagman, who is talking to a witch in magenta robes that Harry doesn't recognize. Victor Crumb is moodily standing in the corner, and Cedric Diggory and Fleur Delacour are in conversation. Fleur looks much happier and keeps throwing her head back so her hair catches the light as a paunchy photographer watches out of the corner of his eye. Bagman acknowledges Harry's arrival and tells him that they are having the wand wang ceremony to make sure all their wands are fully functional. He says there is also going to be a photo shoot and introduces Rita Skeeter, who's doing a piece on the tournament for the Daily Prophet. Her hair is set in elaborate and rigid curls. She wears jeweled spectacles and clutches a crocodile skin handbag with thick fingers ending in two-inch crimson nails. She requests a word with Harry before they start, and Bagman readily agrees before asking Harry if he has any objection. Unsure of what to say, he just says, er, and is steered into a broom cupboard by the reporter. Harry stares at her as she perches on an upturned bucket, pushes Harry onto a cardboard box, and lights some candles she gets out of her purse. She asks if she can use a quick quotes quill so she can talk more freely with him, and Harry isn't sure what that is. She smiles, showing off three gold teeth, and pulls an acid green quill and some parchment out of her bag. She sucks on the tip of the quill and then places it on the parchment where it balances on its own. She tests that it's working, giving her name and title, and the quill begins to write. Attractive blonde Rita Skeeter, 43, whose savage quill has punctured many inflated reputations. She says lovely and then rips off the top piece of parchment before asking Harry what made him decide to enter the tournament. Harry is distracted by the quill, which begins to write even though he hasn't said anything yet, and he reads, An ugly scar, souvenir of a tragic past, disfigures the otherwise charming face of Harry Potter. Rita tells him to ignore the quill and again asks why he entered the tournament. Harry explains that he didn't enter, that he doesn't know how his name got in the Goblet of Fire, but the reporter doesn't believe him. She raises her eyebrow and tells him that their readers love a rebel, but Harry again insists that he didn't enter. Rita changes tactics and asks him how he feels about the tasks ahead, wondering if he's excited or nervous. Harry says he hasn't really thought about it, but he supposes he is a little nervous. She reminds him that champions have died in the past and wonder if he's thought about that. He says that it's supposed to be a lot safer this year, and as the quill keeps writing, Rita mentions that Harry has looked death in the face before and asks how that has affected him. Harry isn't sure how to respond, and she continues talking, asking if the trauma in his past has made him keen to prove himself to live up to his name. She suggests that that is why he entered the tournament, and Harry again has to tell her he didn't enter, now starting to feel irritated. Rita again ignores him and asks if he can remember his parents at all. Harry says no, and Rita continues talking, asking how he thinks his parents would feel if they knew he was competing in the tournament. Harry is even more annoyed now, since he has no way of knowing how his parents would feel if they were alive, and he glances down at the words the quill had just written. Tears fill those startlingly green eyes as our conversation turns to the parents he can barely remember. Harry loudly protests that he hasn't got tears in his eyes, and before Rita can respond, Dumbledore pulls open the cupboard door. Rita appears to be delighted, but her quill and parchment has disappeared into her bag as she greets him and asks if he saw her piece about the International Confederation of Wizards Conference from the summer. Dumbledore calls it enchantingly nasty and says that he enjoyed her description of him as an obsolete dingbat, which doesn't faze Rita in the least. 
Before she can defend her words, Dumbledore changes the subject to the weighing of the wands and says that he needs Harry. Harry hurries back into the room and joins the other three champions who are seated in chairs by the door. Professor Karkarov and Madame Maxime have joined Ludo Bagman and are sitting behind the velvet-covered table. Rita settles herself in a corner with her quill, and Dumbledore introduces Mr. Ollivander, who's there to check their wands. Harry recognizes the wand maker who sold him his wand, and watches as he calls each champion over, starting with Fleur Delacour. Ollivander inspects her wand, which is nine and a half inches rosewood, and contains a vila hair, which Fleur says was one of her grandmother's. Harry realizes that she is part Vila and reminds himself to tell Ron before he remembers that Ron isn't speaking to him. Mr. Ollivander says that he finds Vila hair too temperamental to use, but says to each his own and makes a bunch of flowers burst from Fleur's wand. He next calls for Mr. Diggory to come forward and acknowledges that Cedric's wand is one of his. It contains a unicorn hair, is 12 and a quarter inches ash wood. He comments that it's in fine condition, and Cedric says he polished it last night. Harry looks at his own fingerprint-smudged wand and attempts to rub it clean with his robes, but stops when some gold sparks fly out and Fleur gives him a look. Ollivander makes smoke rings come out of Cedric's wand and calls up Victor Crumb. Crumb slouches forward and hands his wand to Mr. Ollivander, who takes it and identifies it as a Grigorovich creation, hornbeam and dragon heartstring, rigid, ten and a quarter inches. He says Avis and makes birds fly out of the end of it and hands it back to Crumb before calling Harry up for his turn. Harry thinks back to his 11th birthday when he purchased his 11-inch holly wand with a phoenix feather core and learned that the bird that supplied the feather for his wand also provided the feather for Lord Voldemort's wand. Harry hasn't told anyone else about this information and really hopes Ollivander doesn't tell everyone, especially since Rita Skeeter and her quick quotes quill is right there. However, Ollivander just spends a bit longer examining Harry's wand, then makes a fountain of wine pour from it and returns it to Harry, declaring it to be in perfect condition. Dumbledore thanks everyone and starts to dismiss the students, but Bagman reminds him that they need to take photos of the champions and judges. Rita agrees that they should take those first, then get some individual shots, and it takes a long time to get everyone organized especially since Madame Maxine is too tall to properly fit in the shot. She ends up sitting with everyone standing around her. The photographer really wants to get Fleur in the front of the picture, but Rita keeps pulling Harry into greater prominence. Eventually, they get the group pictures, then individual shots, and are free to go. Harry heads to dinner and eats by himself, since Hermione is still in the hospital wing getting her teeth fixed. After, he heads back to the Gryffindor Tower and runs into Ron, who brusquely informs him that he had an owl and reminds him of their detentions with Snape tomorrow night, before walking out of the room. Harry considers going after him, but instead decides to read Sirius's reply and pulls the letter off the barn owl's leg. He unrolls it to read a brief letter telling Harry it's too risky to put what he needs to say in a letter and asking him to be alone by the fire in Gryffindor Tower at one in the morning on the 22nd of November. He knows Harry can look after himself and doesn't think anyone will hurt him with Dumbledore and Moody around, but thinks someone is having a good try. He ends the note telling him to be on the watch, continue telling him about anything unusual, and to let him know about the 22nd of November. The movie scene starts out on the flash and smoke of a camera bulb. A woman with blonde curls, red lips, narrow glasses, and an acid green outfit steps through the smoke and calls the group charismatic. The camera cuts to show the four champions posed for the photograph, and the woman walks forward and introduces herself as Rita Skeeter, shaking all of their hands and telling them that she writes for the Daily Prophet. She says they, of course, already knew that, and that it's them that the readers want to get to know. The camera focuses on Fleur de Lacour's face as Rita continues speaking and touches her cheek before giving it a light smack. She walks around and stands between Cedric and Harry, tousling Cedric's hair, posing more questions that she and her readers want to know. She asks who is feeling up to sharing, and when no one answers, she suggests they start with the youngest and grabs Harry by the arm and yanks him aside. The camera cuts to inside a broom cupboard, where a green quill and piece of parchment float into the air as the door opens. Rita Skeeter pulls Harry along and guides him into the cupboard, where she mostly closes the door and steps up to Harry, calling it cozy. 
Harry points out that it's a broom cupboard, and she tells him that he should feel right at home. She directs him to sit down, asking if he minds if she uses the quick quotes quill, and when Harry says no, she launches right into her interview. She describes Harry as a boy of 12 and doesn't acknowledge him at all when he tells her that he is actually 14. She just continues speaking, mentioning that the other three champions are older, vastly more emotionally mature, and have mastered spells that he hasn't even imagined attempting, before finally asking her first question. Concerned? Harry distractedly watches the quill as he responds that he doesn't know, he hasn't really thought about it. Rita tells him to ignore the quill and brings up the fact that he isn't an ordinary boy of 12. Harry again corrects her, but she doesn't acknowledge that he is 14 and asks if he thinks that it is the trauma of his past that made him so keen to enter such a dangerous tournament. Harry explains that he didn't enter and Rita says, oh of course you didn't, but also winks at him and says that everyone loves a rebel. Harry looks at her, unsure of what to say, and she tells the quick quotes Quill to scratch that last part, before bringing up Harry's parents. She asks him how he thinks that they would feel if they were alive, proud or concerned that his attitude at best shows a pathological need for attention and at worst a psychotic death wish. Harry doesn't answer her, again distracted by the Quill. He reads what it had just written down and defensively insists that his eyes are not glistening with the ghosts of his past, causing Rita to give a little shrug. The scene cuts to an owl flying past Hogwarts Castle, up to the owlery, and in through a window, where it lands on a perch in the middle of the room. Harry is standing at the window opposite the owl, looking out over the grounds, and turns to see it holding a letter for him. He takes the letter from the owl's mouth and opens it. As he reads the letter, Sirius Black's voice is heard reading it out loud as a voiceover. He explains that he couldn't risk sending Hedwig since the Ministry has been intercepting more owls and she is too easily recognized. He says they need to talk face to face and asks him if he can meet him in the Gryffindor common room at 1 o'clock Saturday night. He also includes a PS that the bird bites, but the warning comes a little too late as the scene ends on Harry getting bit by the owl. Even though this section has corresponding film scenes, it still has quite a few differences between the two. It really does. In the book, Harry had just gotten out of potions early and was led to a room by Colin Creevy. He enters to find himself in a fairly small classroom with three tables lined up in the front of a blackboard and covered with velvet. Five chairs are behind it. One filled by Ludo Bagman, who's talking to a witch in magenta robes that Harry doesn't recognize. Who could that be? Hmm, I wonder. Victor Crumb is moodily standing in the corner, while Cedric Diggory and Fleur Delacour are deep in conversation. Fleur looks much happier than Victor and keeps throwing her head back, making her hair catch the light. I'm like tossing the hair that I don't have yeah. back as I read this. So if I sound strange, it's because my head keeps moving away from the microphone. <laughs> Just out of habit, really, isn't it? Yes. And by making her hair catch the light, I think that translates to flirting. She's flirting with Cedric Diggory. She's happily flirting with Cedric Diggory. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And it's also being appreciated by a paunchy photographer who's watching her out of the corner of his eye and ear. That's creepy. Yeah. That's ew. Yeah. Bagman acknowledges Harry's arrival and announces that they're having the wand wang ceremony to make sure their wands are fully functional. He says there's also going to be a photo shoot and introduces Rita Skeeter, who's doing a piece on the tournament for the Daily Prophet. Rita Skeeter? We've heard that name before hmm. in the book. I was going to say, <laughs> who would Rita Skeeter be in the movie? We've never heard of her. Who's that? Then? Let's find out, shall we? Speaking of people we haven't seen in the movie, Bagman right? was very obviously not in the movie at all. <laughs> so he was clearly not in this movie scene. Ipso facto. <laughs> Therefore, hence, and whatnot, and other such things. It starts out on a flash of a camera bulb and the flash of the most dramatic entrance this side of Snape's first potions class. <laughs> like, she seriously just goes, whoa, whoa. right through the smoke. It's through the smoke. Mm -hmm. An audacious looking blonde woman in acid green satin, dramatic makeup, and narrow glasses steps out from behind a puff of smoke and surveys the group in front of her, calling them charismatic. I thought the movie got Rita's look right. Yeah. Aside from the green robes instead of magenta. 
The book describes her hair as set in elaborate, rigid curls. She wears jeweled spectacles and clutches a crocodile skin handbag with thick fingers ending in two inch crimson nails. Yeah. Like we said, the biggest difference is that the movie had her in green robes instead of magenta. But I mean, it fit. I thought it was okay. She looked good in green for one thing. Yeah. It also, her robes were the color that I expected the quill to be. Mm -hmm. So that reference kind of tied in for me, which we'll obviously get to. True. Okay. Yeah. But ultimately, I think it just needed to be a very loud color. Yeah. Very attention grabbing. Yeah. Magenta, bright ass green. Everybody was going (laughs) to see that bitch. Right. She wants all the attention on her. She wants to stand out. And that's bright ass clothes are the way to go for that. Yep. Really. But the camera cuts to show the four champions still posed for the photograph. And the woman walks forward and introduces herself as Rita Skeeter. Hey, we finally have a face with a name. Yay. Huzzah. Gotcha, journalist and all around giant bitch. At least I think that's what it says on her business card. She shakes all of their hands and tells them that she writes for the Daily Prophet. Which we already knew. We knew, yes. Because the book. <laughs> However, this is the first we're hearing of this in the movie. Exactly. She assumes that they already know who she is. Well, of course, they've read the book. Well, obviously, yeah. And insists that she and her readers want to get to know them. She steps forward and strokes Fleur's cheek in really kind of a creepy way before giving it a light smack. Also in kind of a creepy way. Yeah. It's not just all around creepy. <laughs> But then she asks what makes a champion tick. She walks around and stands between Cedric and Harry, tousling Cedric's hair like everybody fucking wants to. Because let's be honest, he's like, his hair is like 90s boy band, adorable, and I want to tousle it. So, However, she still makes it a little creepy. Well, it is Rita Skeeter. (laughs) She's posing more questions that she and her readers want to know. She asks who is feeling up to sharing and looks for one of them to volunteer. When they all look at her blankly, she suggests that they start with the youngest. I'm sure completely by chance. She had no intention of just grabbing Harry Potter right away. I'm surprised she even pretended to ask. Right? (laughs) She grabs Harry by the arm and yanks him aside with absolutely zero concern of what any of them actually want. Which, as we will come to find out. Shall we start with the youngest? (laughs) Like, I mean, she just like grabbed the hook. And just... (laughs) But none of that stuff happened in the book. Wait, what? Rita Skeeter just requests a word with Harry before they start, and Bagman just readily agrees before asking if Harry has any objection. I guess at least it crossed his mind. I mean, but at the same time, like, Harry is stuck in this binding magical contract. There must be something written in to where, like, we basically own you. Probably. <laughs> Harry's not sure how to respond. He's like, do you have any objection? And he's just like, err. <laughs> So he just gets steered into a broom cupboard by the reporter. I love the idea that he was just like, yeah, I've got some objection. And they were all just like, great. See you later. Go ahead. Yeah. So (laughs) Harry stares at her as she perches on an upturned bucket and pushes him onto a cardboard box. Then lights some candles that she gets out of her purse. That's creepy. Setting the mood. It's not as creepy as in the movie. No, it's incredibly creepy in the They got the sentiment very similar. They just did it, you know, without Bagman. And I'm still mad about that because Mm -hmm. where the fuck is James Corden? I know I love John Barrowman, but I I would love James Corden too. It would have been great. It would have been great. It would have been great. Yeah. Hmm. Boo. I had to say it in triplicate. (laughs) (laughs) However, the camera cuts to inside the broom cupboard where a green quill and piece of parchment come to attention when the door opens. Skeeter shoves Harry into the cupboard where she really steps up the creepiness by mostly closing the door and getting a wee bit too close to Harry before calling it cozy. It was more than a wee bit close. That's it's creepy. I was uncomfortable. It was very cringe. Yeah. That's the best way I can describe Rita Skeeter. She's very She's cringe. so cringe. Mm-hmm. Harry says that it's a broom cupboard, and in the burn felt round the world, she tells him that, oh, you should feel right at home then. Which is weird, because how's she supposed to know that he had lived in a cupboard? Well, obviously, she wrote the movie, so she wrote the other movies, so she knows. 
I think we actually talked about this before and we were talking about how the Hogwarts letters get addressed to where they're going. Does McGonagall address them or is this something that happens magically? And yeah. because it's magic, is that how they knew that he was in the broom cupboard and then the smallest bedroom and then the hotel and then the hut on the rock and all of those other places? Yeah. Or is it just magic or what? Does somebody legitimately know? Is there a way to find out? And considering that it was for, I mean, yes, it was for 11 years of his life that he was stuck in that cupboard. The wizarding world was not aware that Harry lived and slept in a broom cupboard. Yeah. Perhaps Dumbledore and McGonagall were? Because, you know, if McGonagall knew, she obviously told Dumbledore. Mm -hmm. But I feel like even if Rita Skeeter knew back then, there's no way he would have been like a big secret anymore. Right. Like people would have then known. She would have published that shit right away. Yeah. There's no way that she knew that without making it public knowledge. And I don't think it was public knowledge because that was never addressed. And I think that was a stupid line. So there. <laughs> ah, I love you. <laughs> In the book, she asks if she can use a quick quote squill to allow her to talk more freely with him. But Harry's not sure what that is. So she smiles, showing off three gold teeth and pulls an acid green quill and some parchment out of her bag. As you said, that's the color you were thinking yeah. that her dress was yeah in the movie she directs him to sit down asking if he minds if she uses the quick coats quill harry having no fucking clue what that is allows it because why not he's just like oh okay yeah in the sure. movie he actually does say yes and harry's yeah. just like what's a quick quotes quill in the book so yeah well movie harry doesn't ask questions we know this it's true he does not <laughs> he just meddles he doesn't ask what he's meddling into <laughs> meddle now ask questions later you know, if he asked questions he might have had to meddle less uh yeah definitely huh but he doesn't do that he doesn't nope harry potter and the lack of questions <laughs> boom it's the whole series right there but rita jumps right into the interview the quill starts taking dictation of everything she says though we're not quite sure of its accuracy rita refers to harry as being a mere boy of 12 and makes no acknowledgement when he corrects her 14 yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> in the book, we do get to see what the quill is writing. She sucks on the tip of it and then places it on the parchment where it balances on its own. She tests that it's working, giving her name and title, and the quill begins to write, Attractive blonde Rita Skeeter, 43, whose savage quill has punctured many inflated reputations. She's satisfied and rips off the top piece of parchment before asking Harry what made him decide to enter the tournament. Harry's distracted by the quill, which begins writing even though he hasn't said anything yet, and he reads, An ugly scar, souvenir of a tragic past, disfigures the otherwise charming face of Harry Potter. Rita tells him to ignore the quill, and again asks why he entered the tournament. Harry explains that he didn't enter. Just give it up now, kid. Oh, he doesn't. It's... <laughs> He says he doesn't know how his name got into the Goblet of Fire, but the reporter doesn't believe him. She raises an eyebrow and tells him that her readers love a rebel, but Harry still insists again that he didn't enter. He's not giving it up. Rita changes tactics and asks him how he feels about the tasks ahead, wondering if he's excited or nervous. Harry says he hasn't really thought about it, but he supposes he's a little nervous. A little nervous, Jesus. Well, with everything else going on in his mind, in his world. He's probably in shock. Yeah, he probably can't feel anything at this moment. Right. He needs a blanket. Right. I'm in shock. I have he a blanket. He needs a support badger. Yes. Not everyone's lucky enough to have a Carly in their lives, though. Sorry, Harry. Sucks to be your ass. In the movie, she brings up how much better all the other champions are in terms of their emotional maturity and skill level, having mastered things that he can't even dream of before finally asking her first question. Concerned? <laughs> like, that's it. That's, that's all she says. That's all it that's is. That's her question. That's her fucking question. Like, really? Come on. It's the most leading question right? <laughs> that I have ever, ever listened to. It's just like... How do you want me to answer this? Because yeah. it's yes or no. And Harry's just like, this is a terrible interview question. Right. But really, she knows exactly what she's doing. Yeah. Because she's fucking Rita Skeeter. and She's a terrible fucking garbage human. Trash Rita. Oh, my God. She's such a trash Rita. 
<laughs> Harry distractedly answers that he hadn't really thought about it while trying to see what the quill is scribbling, since it seems to be writing more than what he's actually saying. Rita tells him to ignore it and brings up the fact that he isn't an ordinary boy of 12. 14. Harry tries to correct her again, but she ignores him and presses on, asking if he is here because his life has fucked him up in the head enough to want to take on this dangerous competition. It is a bit similar in the book, Mm -hmm. though she's not as directly nasty. Again, you were paraphrasing, so... (laughs) (laughs) She also reminds him that the champions have died in the past and wonders if he's thought about that. He says that it's supposed to be a lot safer this year, and as the quill keeps writing, Rita mentions that Harry has looked death in the face before and asks how that's affected him. So she's given the same implication Mm -hmm. in the movie, but in the movie she's just much more directly being like, you kind of fucked up. Yeah. That's why you're doing all this attention-seeking shit. Yeah. Like, you're screwed in the head, right? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you are. Wasn't really a question telling you. You're screwed in the head. So, obviously, you're going to do some death-defying shit. Obviously. Obviously. (laughs) Harry isn't sure how to respond, and she continues talking, asking if the trauma in his past has made him keen to prove himself to live up to his name. She suggests that that's why he entered the tournament, and Harry again has to tell her that he didn't enter, now starting to feel irritated. Just now? Jesus. Now starting to feel irritated specifically with Rita. I mean, even so, I'm like... (laughs) My, my question still stands just now. <laughs> In the movie, Harry also once again denies entering himself, and Rita placates him while also clearly implying that he's a sassy little liar by winking and saying that everybody loves a rebel. Which, come on, so trash. Trash, Rita. <laughs> so trash. Harry has no idea how to respond to that, opting to simply stare with his mouth agape while Rita tells her quill to scratch that last line. Then, just to really establish her as a trash human, she brings up Harry's parents. Which is straight from the book, as trash Rita ignores him and asks if he can remember his parents at all. Harry says no, and Rita continues talking, asking how he thinks his parents would feel if they knew he was competing in the tournament. So shit. Uh Uh-huh. So shit. Again, this part is pretty similar in the movie. She asks him if they were alive, would they feel proud or worried that Harry's actions seem to spell out a need for therapy no matter what brush you paint it with? (laughs) Harry is again distracted by the scribbling of the quill, so he doesn't answer her. In the book, Harry's described as being more annoyed than confused, since he has no way to know how his parents would feel if they were alive, and he glances down at the words the quill had just written. Tears fill those startling green eyes as our conversation turns to the parents he can barely remember. That quill needs to go fuck itself. (laughs) (laughs) Harry loudly protests that he hasn't got tears in his eyes, and before Rita can respond, Dumbledore pulls open the cupboard door. Saved! In the movie, Harry's confusion quickly turns to annoyance when he reads what had just been written down and gets pretty defensive and understandably fed up with her shit. He calls both Rita and the Quill out for saying some flowery bullshit about ghosts in his eyes, but Rita just gives a little shrug because Rita gives no fucks. Trash Rita. Trash Rita gives zero fucks. There is another little section that corresponds with the book chapter, but this part ends here. The book keeps going with Rita appearing to be delighted by the arrival of Dumbledore, but her quill and parchment has disappeared into her bag as she greets him. Hmm. She asks if he saw her piece about the International Confederation of Wizards Conference from the summer. Dumbledore calls it enchantingly nasty and says he enjoyed her description of him as an obsolete dingbat. Which was our trivia question. Yep. Doesn't phase Rita in the least. Before she can defend her words... Dumbledore changes the subject and says he needs Harry for the weighing of the wands. Harry bolts from Rita as quick as he can. Understandably. And rejoins the other three champions who are seated in chairs by the door. Professor Karkarov and Madame Maxime are sitting with Ludo Bagman behind the velvet-covered table. And Rita settles herself into a corner with her quill as Dumbledore introduces Mr. Ollivander, who's there to check their wands. I wish we would have gotten to see Ollivander in the movie again. Boo. 
Harry recognizes the wand maker who sold him his wand and watches as he called each champion over, starting with Fleur Delacour. Ollivander inspects her wand, which is nine and a half inches, rosewood, and contains a Vila hair, which Fleur says was one of her grandmothers. Harry realizes that she is part Vila and makes a mental note to let Ron know before remembering that Ron is not speaking to him. Awkward. Mr. Ollivander says that he finds Vila hair too temperamental to use, but says to each his own and makes a bunch of flowers burst from Fleur's wand. I love how he gives shade yeah. to the other wand makers. I didn't make this wand. That's because it's trash. Right. I personally don't use this, but I mean, you can use whatever you want. Like, it's cool. That's fine. This is but... obviously the wand that chose you, but like saying. I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> He next calls for Mr. Diggory to come forward and acknowledges that Cedric's wand is one of his. It contains a unicorn hair, is 12 and a quarter inches, ashwood. He comments that it's in fine condition, and Cedric says he polished it last night. <laughs> Harry looks down at his own fingerprint smudged wand and attempts to rub it clean with his robes, but stops when some gold sparks fly out and Fleur gives him a look. Ollivander makes smoke rings come out of Cedric's wand and calls up Victor Crumb. Crumb slouches forward and hands his wand to Mr. Ollivander, who takes it and identifies it as a Gregorovich creation. Gregorovich. Remember hmm. that name. Gregorovich. Hmm. Hornbeam and dragon heartstring, rigid, ten and a quarter inches. He makes birds fly out of the end of it and hands it back to Crumb before calling Harry up for his turn. He gives a little bit of shade towards Grigorovich as well, but it sounds like he used a core that Ollivander approves of. So. Yeah. Ollivander approved core. Right. <laughs> Harry hands his wand over and Ollivander says he well remembers. Harry remembers himself and thinks back to his 11th birthday when he purchased his 11 inch holly wand with a phoenix feather core and learned that the bird that supplied the feather for his wand also provided a feather for lord voldemort's wand happy memories yeah good times <laughs> harry hasn't told anyone else about this information and really hopes that Ollivander doesn't decide to share it <laughs> especially with rita skeeter and her quick quotes quill right there right that would actually be really bad idea yeah but Ollivander seems pretty smart and yeah. he doesn't say anything so he just spends a little bit longer examining harry's wand then makes a fountain of wine pour from it and returns it to harry declaring it to be in perfect condition and harry's just like wait what was that spell again right <laughs> <laughs> i gotta teach it to seamus <laughs> right <laughs> Dumbledore thanks everyone and starts to dismiss the students, but Bagman reminds Dumbledore that they need to take photos of the champions and judges. Which is different from the movie since it implied that they start with photos, and obviously there was no wand weighing at all. And I can see why they didn't include the wand weighing. It wasn't yeah. really pertinent to the plot. Like, it was fun to hear about the other champions' wands. Yeah. And it was interesting to hear Ollivander shade and... You know, that was fun, but at the same time, it's not entirely relevant. I would have loved to see John Hurt do that scene, though. Mm -hmm. I would have loved it. It would have been nice to have gotten the early mention of Grigorovich. Yeah. That's always fun, but again, yeah, it's not pertinent. Yeah, it's not that necessary. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Rita agrees that they should take the group pictures first and then get some individual shots. It takes a long time to get everyone organized, especially since Madame Maxime is too tall and didn't properly fit into the shot. Like everywhere they had her arranged, she was just like casting shadows on people or they couldn't get like she would like cut off her head. Or they'd have to have like stand back in the distance. Or... Right. Sounds like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so she ended up sitting with everyone standing around her. The photographer keeps putting Fleur in the front. And then Rita Skeeter keeps moving Harry to the front. And it just makes me picture that, like, you're in front, you're in front, you're in front, you're in front. Like, just... And the next thing you know, they're, like, directly in the front of the camera. Pink. The dress is blue. <laughs> the dress is pink. Harry, Fleur, Harry, Fleur. <laughs> Eventually, they get through the group pictures, then individual shots, and then they're free to go. Harry heads to dinner and eats by himself because Hermione is still in the hospital wing getting her teeth fixed. Aww. 
I know they ended up leaving out the fact that Hermione had bigger teeth. Mm -hmm. The buck teeth, yeah. But they still could have had her teeth be enlarged. Yeah, well, for sure. And I do want to say more about the fact that they had to leave out her buck teeth. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to bring that up when we get to a later scene. Because I think it's more relevant to that moment than right now. Mm -hmm. But I think it's kind of sad that we didn't get to see... Snape's true colors as an educator and how that affected Hermione mm -hmm. and how that ended up only adding to Harry's sense of loneliness and stress throughout all of this. Yeah. After dinner, he heads back to Gryffindor Tower and runs into Ron, who actually speaks to him, Ooh. and brusquely informs him that he's had an owl. Plus, he reminds him of their detentions with Snape the next night, but then just walks right out of the room, so... Baby steps, I guess? I guess. Sure. Harry considers going after him, but instead decides to read Sirius's reply and pulls the letter off the barn owl's leg. He unrolls it to read a brief letter telling Harry it's too risky to put what he needs to say in a letter and asking him to be alone by the fire in Gryffindor Tower at one in the morning on the 22nd of November. He says that he knows Harry can look after himself, but doesn't think anyone will hurt him with Dumbledore and Moody around. But he also thinks somebody's having a good try. He ends the note instructing him to be on the watch, to continue telling him about anything unusual, and to let him know about the 22nd of November. There is a scene that corresponds to this in the movie, but it's about as different as you can get while still getting the same basic information across. The scene cuts from Trash Rita to an owl flying across the grounds to the owlery and landing on a perch in the middle of the room. Harry is standing at the window opposite the owl, just hanging out in a room covered in bird feces, like you do. Like you do. Mm -hmm. He turns to see it holding a letter for him in his beak. He opens the letter and begins reading as super calm and chill Gary Oldman. Mild-mannered Gary Oldman. <laughs> can be heard reading it out loud as a voiceover. He explains that Hedwig is too well known and that he doesn't want her to be intercepted since the ministry has been pulling that bullshit lately. He says they need to talk face to face and tells him to meet him in the Gryffindor common room on Saturday night. The book specifies that it's November the 22nd, which could be a Saturday night. Sure. But we don't know. However, in both, the meet time is 1 a.m. We're going to get more into the organizational shit show that this part became in the episode covering the next chapter. Yeah. And it really was an organizational shit show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the letter also includes a P.S. that the bird bites, but he probably should have mentioned that sooner as the owl is already in the process of taking Harry's finger clean the fuck off. Because why not make the kid who's already suffered a lot and gearing up to suffer more bleed a little? It builds character. <laughs> But this is where the movie section ends, so we can move on to our new actors. And we actually have one! What? Yeah, it's exciting. Miranda Richardson makes her debut as Rita Skeeter. She did amazing. Oh my god, she was phenomenal. She was such an annoying bitch. Yeah, she was such a trash Rita. I loved it. She was so haughty. Mm-hmm. And just, oh, it was amazing. She was such a gotcha journalist. Yeah. Oh, she was perfect. You know. The way that she asked that question, the way she phrased it, so that his only choice was to answer yes or no. Now, obviously, that was how it was written for her. But the way she delivered it. It's, yeah, a lot of it was the delivery was just impeccable. Her accent, her just general demeanor, everything mm -hmm. about it. And they made her look exactly what I imagined. We said that right. earlier. But I thought that Miranda Richardson was just absolutely perfect. It was perfect casting. Like most of the adults were perfectly casted, but some yeah. of them were just so good. And she was just exactly what I pictured. I was a little bummed we actually didn't get as much with her throughout the series yeah. as we could have. Oh, well, because so much could have been done. She had such a much bigger part in the books than in the movies and Miranda Richardson's awesome. And we wish that we could have seen more of her because we have just discussed in this moment that we didn't get to see as much as we should have gotten to see. And we'll talk more about that because that is disappointing. We will. When mm -hmm. we get there. Our Potter Pondering this week is how would you handle an interview with Rita Skeeter? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We really look forward to reading them. <laughs> 
This will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from Maria Culla. She writes, The old Pottermore website sorted me into Hufflepuff, the new one into Ravenclaw, with which I identify so much more. My wand is 11 and 3 quarters inches and slightly yielding flexibility, made out of laurel wood and has a dragon heartstring core. My Patronus is an otter, just like Hermione's. <laughs> <laughs> I watched the first movie at my sister's birthday sleepover party when I was maybe six years old. My sister and her friends, four years older than me, were all so scared of Voldemort, and I found him funny looking and fascinating. <laughs> you sure you're not Slytherin? When I was seven, my parents bought me a bunny. I wanted to call it Voldemort, but wasn't allowed to. <laughs> That's amazing. So I called her after my favorite character, Hermione. Thank you so much for sharing your sorting hat story, Maria. I love that you tried to name your bunny Voldemort. <laughs> I think that would have been amazing. Right? Honestly. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can just message it to us over social media. And now for the moment we know Mike has been skipping through this episode trying to find this week's trivia question, <laughs> which is... What were Ron and Harry forced to do during their two-hour detention in Snape's dungeon? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word, hashtag, could have been the Forbidden Forest, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at justkeeprolling.com to check out our Just Keep Rolling and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. In addition to giving you some extra perks like Just Keep Rolling swag, patron-only Facebook groups, virtual meetups, bonus content, and more, your patronage also helps us to continue producing this podcast, our cooking show, and bringing more content your way. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 19, The Weighing of the Wands, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just, just keep, keep rolling. rolling.